Simeon and Levi and all of those brothers, they were unworthy of what Joseph was fixing to do for them. They were unworthy of the suffering and the pain that he went through so that he could come to the place of which he would be there delivered. But yet, whether they were unworthy or not, he was willing to do that. And he accepted his place in that. Aren't you glad Jesus died, you and I, while we were in our sins? While we were unworthy. He did not die for the righteous, but he came to call sinners unto repentance. When I think about those, those 20 some years of him giving his life down there in Egypt, much like Christ for 33 and a half years giving his life in this world, not only were they unworthy of what he did, but they were unaware of what was coming in their direction. They did not know that God was going to send a famine that would be so severe that it would affect all of mankind. And if left to themselves, they would not be able to sustain themselves. They would not be able to preserve themselves because they did not even know that it was coming causes me to think of all of humanity who seems to be so shallow in their speaking of God and, and their, their talk of religion, not realizing that they're only one heartbeat away from hell. And that all mankind is under the judgment of God because of sin. And yet they go through life so flippant and uh, as if that it really doesn't matter. They're unaware. They're unaware. That's why God Christ cried from the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This world is marching off into eternity unaware of what they're going to have to face. Joseph is here. And the reason why he's here is because there are those unworthy. There are those who are unaware. There are those who are unprepared. And there are those who are unconcerned about their future. I'm glad that Jesus took care over 2,000 years ago of what I never even realized needed to be taken care of. My sin. I'm glad that 2,000 years ago, long before we were ever in existence, he was in this world sacrificing himself, making preparation for you and for me to settle everything in our lives as far as our future is concerned. The old account was settled, thank God, long ago. That's right. It was settled so long ago, back at and thank God in a personal sense, as a 14-year-old boy, it was settled personally in my heart. Not because of any preparation I had made, not because of any deeds that, that I had done that would cause me to be ready for what I did not know I was going to face. But because Jesus came and faced it all yeah. and made a readiness for me that I can simply believe on his finished work. These boys come and step in to Joseph's salvation. It was his works. It was his experiences. It was his suffering. It was his rejection. It was the hate toward him. He had to go through all of that. Not them. But he went through all of it because he was giving his life to change their lives. Aren't you glad he can change your life? I was, uh, I heard the story of an old, a, a young coal miner in West Virginia. You know, I didn't know that, that you have coal, well, you know it, here in, in Alabama. I wouldn't agree. But, uh, born and raised in West Virginia, coal's everywhere. And, uh, and this young coal miner got right with the Lord. And he went back to work, and of course, those other coal miners began to tease him and to ridicule him and 
so on. One old timer asked him one day, he said, son, surely you don't believe all they're telling you about the Bible. You don't believe that, that story over there where, where Jesus turned water into wine? And the young boy kind of bowed his head and he said, well, to be honest with you, I, 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 I've never even heard that story. I've just got saved. I've never read the Bible. And, and uh, I don't know anything about it. Jesus turning water into wine. And he said, I can't tell you this much. Up at my house, he's turned beer into furniture. <laughs> Aren't you glad that he's able to make the change? Yeah. Joseph is like Jesus. Is, is that his whole life was in the attempt of changing men's future. Now, the second thing that I want to point out to you seems to be cruel, but it has a purpose. It causes an uneasiness in these brethren. He, he does not automatically and instantly just bring them into his presence and, and hold them up tight and pat them on the back and tell them that everything is all right. Before he does that, he leads them into a spirit of now, repentance is not an easy experience, is it? Uh, it's a bittersweet experience. Of which you have come in contact with, with Christ as the Savior, but yet at the same time, He's pointing out that you are the sinner. And something has to be done about that. And the only way that that can be taken care of is you're going to have to repent of that sin. Turn your back on that sin and, 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 it, and it produces within you a, 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 uh, a desire to abhor those sins. When Joseph brings these boys in, when he sees who they are, he begins to reach inside their hearts and, and he begins to bring confessions out of them and he begins to produce a, a conviction in them. God allows him to work on them in a very in a very uh, specific way. I do not believe anybody ever gets saved until they have, they have come to the place that they realize they are sinners yeah. and they're willing to turn from their sin. That's right. right. And they said, oh, what about the child who may be coming to Christ at six, seven, eight years old? I believe that is possible. But I'm going to tell you something. You're not a sinner because of all the sins you've committed. You're a sinner by, by nature and the potential lies within you to be the worst of sinners. That's right. I do not measure myself with all the other sinners and say, well, I don't know that I needed salvation as bad as because look, I didn't do all. I was not a Hitler. I was not a Mussolini. But I want to say to you, short of the grace of God and salvation, I could have been the worst of the worst. That's the conviction I felt. Concerning our brother, 
in that we saw the anguish of his soul. And he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress. Come upon us. Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against this child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. They don't even know that that's Joseph right there that's listening to them. <laughs> And they said, you know, we, we, his blood is, is at our hands. And then in verse number 28, and he said unto his brethren, uh, let me see if that's the verse. Yeah, he said unto his brethren, my money is restored, and, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them. Joseph had had their money put back into their sacks, and when they came back, they come to confess it. And the Bible said, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? You know, I, I'm not interested in motivational speeches when it comes to preaching. Yeah. I'm not interested in trying to get people to make an emotional move. Yeah. What I like to see is when the Holy Ghost has reached down into that heart and tightened it up. Amen. And it starts flowing out of the mouth saying, Preacher, I am lost. Yeah. And I need a Savior. Amen. There is confession, thank God, and there is conviction. <laughs> and when that happens, you're not there to debate how right you were or how less wrong you were.
the Lord. He said, I, I, I do. He said, I think I do. He said, when I'm off, he said, you know where the hawk pen is up by that northwest corner? He said, you goes up there in that, and cross over in that fence, and you gets down in that hog pen, walk around, turn, and calls upon the Lord. He said, he's going to Sam. And he said, now, Sam, he said, I, 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 I know you, that's, and he turned and he walked off. But he went back to the meeting that night, and he got so heavy on the conviction when he went back home. He, he, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he got up, got the old man and started across over to the bunkhouse where Sam slept. And he beat on the door. Sam opened the door and said, Boss, man, what's wrong? He said, Sam, said, I've come to tell you that I need to be saved the worst in the world. He said, if what that preacher's preaching is true, he said, I'm going to go to hell before this night's over with. He said, I've been trying to talk to you, and you've been talking foolishness. Can you tell me how to be saved? He said, he really wants to know, boss. He said, the worst in the world. He said, you know where that hog pit is up in the northwest corner? He said, if he goes up there and you cross across that fence and gets down that blood and water around, turn to Jesus. And he goes. The old boss man, he turned and he just jumped off of that porch and he started running up toward the hog pen. <laughs> old Sam saw what he's doing. And he hollered and said, boss man, wait a minute, wait a minute. Boss man, whoa, whoa, whoa. Boss man, come back with his two ladies. Old so Sam got to running at him and said, stop. I want you to know the past is set. 